The Story of the Human Body by Daniel Lieberman is the first book of 2017 that we read as part of my online book club. I'm guessing that you're sitting down right now, staring at your phone. Am I right? Do you wear shoes, drink soda, or read books? Well, Lieberman argues that our bodies aren't actually adapted to the vast amounts of time we spend on modern day activities like these. Widespread problems like asthma, diabetes, and overpopulation were barely a problem up until a few hundred years ago. That's less than 1% of the time modern humans have been on Earth. Although this book was only published in 2013, nearly 3,000 readers rated this book a solid 4.2 stars, and I personally gave it a 5. As of January 2017, it's ranked number 10 in Ty Lopez's top 162 books. Lieberman's lessons could save you decades of your life, so make sure you watch this video to the very end. Lesson 1. What are evolutionary mismatches? Put simply, it's a state of imbalance whereby a trait that evolved in one environment becomes less effective in another environment. Over time, natural selection adapts and matches organisms to specific environmental conditions. So what on earth does that mean? Well, let's take a zebra for example. It's adapted to run on the African savanna, run from lions, cope with the hot climate, and resist certain diseases. But if you transported a zebra to England, it wouldn't have to worry about lions, but it would suffer from problems such as a struggle to find enough grass to eat, staying warm in winter, and resisting new types of diseases. The zebra would likely get sick and die because it is poorly adapted to its new environment. The same is true for humans. Migration is one example of an evolutionary mismatch. For example, when Northern Europeans move to sunny places like my home country Australia, they become more likely to get skin cancer because pale skin offers little natural protection against high levels of solar radiation. Now that we have an understanding of evolutionary mismatches, let's move on to the second lesson. Mismatch diseases and why we should care about them. So mismatch diseases are diseases that result from our paleolithic bodies being poorly adapted to certain modern behaviours and conditions. They are caused by stimuli that are too much, too little, or too new. For example, too much fat, too little fat, or new fats the body can't digest, such as partially hydrogenated fats. Determining which diseases are evolutionary mismatches is challenging for three reasons. A. There is no clear answer to what humans are adapted for. B. We lack a solid understanding of many diseases to pinpoint environmental factors as causes. And C. We lack solid data on hunter-gatherer health, especially from the Paleolithic era. But with that said, strong evidence suggests that type 2 diabetes and heart disease are mismatched diseases, two of the highest leading causes of death in the United States. Humans evolved over the last few million years to consume a diverse diet of fruits, wild animals, nuts, and other food rich in fibre but low in sugar. It's hardly surprising we contract such diseases after consuming modern foods loaded with sugar but depleted of fibre. This includes soda and chocolate ice cream, etc. So why should we care about mismatched diseases? Well, because A, you'll most likely suffer and die from one, and B, they contribute to the bulk of healthcare spending throughout the world. Lesson 3. Why disevolution is harming the world. Disevolution is the harmful feedback loop that occurs over multiple generations when we don't treat the causes of a mismatched disease, but instead pass on whatever environmental factors cause the disease, keeping the disease prevalent and sometimes making it worse. So for example, let's compare two common mismatched diseases, scurvy and cavities. Scurvy is caused by insufficient vitamin C and used to be common in soldiers, sailors and others whose diets lacked fresh fruit and vegetables, which are rich in this vitamin. Today, scurvy is rarely seen because it's easily prevented by adding vitamin C to processed foods. Now consider cavities. Bacteria attaches to your teeth as plaque and feeds off the sugars in the food we chew and then it releases acids that dissolve your tooth. Without treatment, a cavity can cause excruciating pain and an infection. Humans have a poor natural defense against cavity causing microbes, likely because we didn't evolve to eat crazy quantities of sugary and starchy foods. Cavities were rare in the hunter-gatherers, but went viral after the introduction of agriculture, and they spiked in the 19th and 20th centuries. Today, 2.5 billion people worldwide are affected by cavities. Now the reason scurvy is rarely seen, yet cavities are widespread, is because we haven't effectively treated the root causes of cavities like we have with scurvy. 
We treat the symptoms instead of the causes. Let me repeat that. We treat the symptoms instead of the causes. Dentists drill cavities out and replace them with fillings. We brush, we floss, and we have regular dental checkups if we can afford them. But if we really wanted to prevent cavities, we would have to address the root cause and stop eating so much sugar and starch. However, since the introduction of farming, we have become dependent on foods such as starchy cereals and grains for their calories. Cavities are the price we pay for cheap calories. So as we continue to treat the symptoms rather than the causes, we cultivate an environment that encourages that. We will pass on those environmental conditions to our children, which allows cavities and other diseases to persist and potentially grow from generation to generation. Lederman claims he didn't pass on his cavities to his daughter, but he did pass on a diet that causes them, and she is likely to do the same to her children. This, my friends, is disevolution. And by understanding it, we can make better decisions not just for our own health, but for the next generation. The fourth lesson, did farming screw us over? Farming may have led to civilization and other types of progress, but it also led to misery and death on a grand scale. Most of the mismatched diseases from which we currently suffer stem from the transition from hunting and gathering to farming. So when and why did we start doing it? A farming began around 12,000 years ago, likely due to population stress. Once the polar ice caps melted and the earth began to heat up, hunter-gatherers experienced a dramatic increase in population. The places where people lived became larger. They had more children. But this puts stress on communities who cannot survive at high population densities. Feeding all those children would have put huge pressure on their hunting and gathering efforts. That's where farming may have stepped in. Humans could settle down in one place and tend to their crops all year round. To feed more mouse, they started domesticating the most nutritious plants that were easier to grow, harvest and process. Animals were also domesticated. Eventually, cultivated crops took place of gathered plants and domesticated animals took place of hunted ones. Farming likely spread due to population growth. Thanks to the easy access to animal milk and cereal, a farming mother could feed more children at half the age of hunter-gatherer children. She could maintain twice the amount of babies in half the time and therefore produce more. This could have doubled the rate of population growth, assuming infant mortality rates were the same among hunter-gatherers as they were for farmers. Farmers pumped out more babies to help with work on the farm. Their babies grew up, had more babies to help work on the farm, which led to population growth causing farming to spread like wildfire. Farm food is easier to produce in large quantities, but at the cost of quality, nutrition, and fueling mismatched diseases. Cereals and plants grown on farms are starchy and often lack sufficient fiber, which can contribute to type 2 diabetes and other problems. With farming still happening today, perhaps we should think twice before diving into a second serving of Fruit Loops. Moving on to lesson five, why population growth makes us vulnerable. Farming triggered population growth, which brought on new kinds of diseases. Plagues require a large population, which didn't happen until farming. Plagues also need permanent settlements with high population densities. Farmers live in villages, which allow them to share resources. There were social and economic benefits, but at the cost of contagion. Diseases such as malaria and chickenpox spread much more easily. And because we now live in close contact with domesticated animals, We've contracted over 50 new diseases such as tuberculosis, measles, leprosy, typhus, influenza, and much more. Luckily, modern medicine and public health have made strong moves in combating these diseases. But as our population grows at an alarming rate, we are vulnerable to new epidemics. Lesson six, how were we affected by the industrial revolution? The industrial revolution was an economic and technological revolution in which humans started to use fossil fuels to generate power for machines to build and transport things in huge quantities. Capitalism became the world's dominant economic system where people competed to produce goods and services for profit. But why should we care about it? The reason is because it completely changed what we eat, how we eat, work, walk and run, keep cool, keep warm, give birth, get sick, mature, reproduce, grow old and socialize. Consider a bank clerk a job that didn't exist before the Industrial Revolution. A bank clerk spends as much energy a day to do her job as she gets from eating three glazed donuts, but a coal miner would need to eat 15 donuts. Hunter-gatherers used to travel 9 to 15 kilometers a day. That is a lot. 
I think we can all agree that we move much, much less than that. We also work less hours, which means less physical activity. The typical factory worker in the US works 40 hours a week, which is half as much hours than during the 19th century. We now have cars, bicycles, planes, subways, and escalators. Less than 3% of shoppers in an American mall voluntarily take the stairs when an escalator is available. Less movement has contributed to the obesity epidemic. It's also dramatically changed what we eat. I'm sure you're aware that there's loads of crap in modern food, so I won't go into detail. During the rise of the Industrial Revolution, European cities smelt horrible and waste management was nearly non-existent. Human feces would end up in people's drinking water. Toilets and soap were actually luxuries for the wealthy. Clothing and bedding were rarely washed. And to top it all off, sterilization and refrigeration did not exist. Industrialization fueled the development of sewer management, soaps, and inexpensive drugs. It helped the population explode further and increase economic output. We only discovered that microbes caused infections in 1856. Innovations like pasteurization were born, the process of heating milk, wine, and other substances, which instantly boosted profits and prevented millions of deaths. But the desire for profit helped inspire bad medical ideas. It became common for products and services to be marketed as magic fixes for health problems. I think it's fair to say not much has changed, apart from stricter regulations. Lastly, we sleep less than we used to. The typical American spends seven and a half hours in bed and sleeps for just 6.1 hours. Hunter-gatherers would wake up before 7 a.m., have a one to two hour nap at midday and go to bed around 9 p.m. They got more sleep than us. Today we have bright lights, televisions, and mobile phones to keep us awake. At least 10% of people in developed populations suffer from insomnia due to a mix of physiological and psychological factors, including too much alcohol, a crappy diet, lack of exercise, anxiety, depression, and others. Liebman argues that although we've made great advances, the industrial era didn't necessarily benefit how our bodies grow and function.